Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day just to be alive by your grace. We know you didn't have to think of us, but not only did you consider us, but you chose to love us unconditionally. And you chose to make peace with us, even though we were the ones who offended you. And Father, for this we are eternally grateful for your kindness, your mercy, your grace. Help us never be familiar with these qualities that you possess in perfection. Father, right now also we especially lift up our pastor and Joey, who are in India, representing us there. We ask that you guide them and touch them in every way, help them be filled with your spirit, and be used mightily for your name and for your glory. We thank you in advance for answering our prayers and using us for eternal glory in some way. Father, please bless this message. Have your spirit guide us and teach us. And it's in Christ's precious name we pray, by the power of your spirit. Amen. All right, well, as we begin today, uh, we're going to first give you a little update from our beloved pastor, who is now in India. And I'm going to read to you his email that he sent, per his wishes, and share with you a few pictures. So first of all, on the board, we see uh, Joey and Pastor with um, Madhava and his wife, Nirmala. You can see some of the garb, the uh, loose clothing, thank God, loose light clothing, and it's uh, about 110 degrees over there. So here's uh, Pastor's email to us. Hello, my beloved congregation. Greetings from Andhra Pradesh, where Joey and I just got back from a warm night's walk on the town surrounding the Mercy and Grace Charities compound. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start at the beginning. We departed from Boston on Saturday morning for JFK, New York City, where we caught the 14-hour flight to New Delhi, India. After about a three-hour layover, we took a two-hour flight to Via Jawada and arrived at around 9 p.m. on Sunday, only one hour late. Our time zone is now nine and a half hours ahead of Massachusetts. Madhava and his son, Rajesh, met us outside the baggage claim with some beautiful bouquets of flowers, one for each of us. We made it to the compound and were in our air-conditioned room. They're really roughing it out there. <laughs> Uh, he says, we made it to our compound and we're in an air-conditioned room, the only one in the complex. Yes, we are spoiled. Joey slept about four hours and I slept 30 minutes. LOL. So day one, Monday, was the pastor's conference. And here's a picture of the pastors in the building there. Um, and this is like the front view. And then also he, they gave us a picture here of the back, from the back of the room. And I know you can't see it here, but the slide that Pastor put up there actually is our North Christian Church slide for his presentation. You can't see it there, but you can see it in the background. So he's using our, our church slide, and as he said, he's you know obviously going to represent us. I taught my lesson on how to lead a congregation while Rajesh translated. I found it a little clunky, and it precluded me from preaching off the cuff, but the crowd of about 70 pastors was very grateful. We shared a wonderfully prepared lunch, and then I taught my lesson on a pastor's example, which was very well received as it was grounded in the doctrine of love. We went back to our room at about 3.30, where we both collapsed from our lack of sleep and heat exhaustion. It's close to 110 degrees and humid. We received the knock at the door around 7 p.m., which woke us both up from dead sleeps. I took a Portuguese shower, Ha, ha, ha. And we headed downstairs for some leftovers and then out on the road where we briefly joined a coming-of-age party for a young lady down the street. Quite a gathering. We were, we, where we were essentially forced to eat, even though we were stuffed. LOL. The locals are quite hospitable. We are back in our room for the night, so I'm writing this to you all 
whom I already miss, but this is God's will, and to his glory we shall press on in spreading the gospel amongst a people comprised of a mere 2 to 3 percent Christians. Thank you so much for your continued prayers. Much love and gratitude to you all, for we are merely representatives of North Christian Church, that precious little church on a hill. Love in Christ, Pastor. P.S. Joey, looks, Joey is like a celebrity. Between his relative size and his bearded good looks, I catch folks staring. Medhava said he is, quote unquote, beautiful. <laughs> this is how they talk out there, I'm telling you. No. <laughs> uh, it's a little different. Madhava said he's beautiful. So you know what to call Joey when he gets back. <laughs> and Rajesh said, Rajesh said, I look like a Chinaman with my soul patch. <laughs> LOL. Pass this little thing under here. Anyway. PSS. The audience pictures below were taken by Joey before and after my lessons. That's what you see on the board now. Uh, it is customary for other pastors to rotate out and sing unto the Lord while the crowd funnels into the room. It's different than what we're used to. We bought each pastor a new Bible in their native tongue and gave them a little monetary gift to go out and evangelize with. So your donations are going to good use. There you can see Pastor and Joey with all the pastors holding up their new Bibles in their language. And the other pic, uh, which we saw in the beginning, is of Nirmala and Madhava at the close of the pastor's conference. Wednesday, we have the children's and youth conferences. So that's tomorrow, which for them is almost today, as it's about 4 or 5 in the morning there now. So uh, pray for them, and that's going on today, coming up. You know what I mean. <laughs> all right, so we get all the pictures in. Uh, so let's just continue to keep them in prayer. Uh, God's will be done while they're there. They're able to touch a lot of people and... You'd be surprised how some people listen a little bit harder when they have a visitor like that from America who they might be too familiar with, the people there preaching or unbelievers come and join just to, just to uh, see the American. So pray, you know, God brings the right people, draws them in, uh, what's meant to happen. But what a wonderful way to share the gospel and the word and live in the Great Commission, right? So hopefully this inspires some of us to think out of the box on what the Lord might want each of us to do. You know, because as far as I know, Pastor doesn't think missionary work is his calling, but he obeyed the Spirit and went out um, as part of the Great Commission. And, you know, sometimes we put God in a box, right? We all do that, and we say, oh, I could never do that or whatever. But how about being open and praying openly and ask, see what he puts in your soul. See what he convicts you of, and you never know. You know, it's a wonderful thing, and it's all God's work anyway. All right. So, let's jump into our lesson, Peace Be With You, Part 2. On Sunday, we saw that after the Lord's victorious sacrifice on the cross for our benefit, and after He came back from the dead three days later, He appeared in the midst of all the disciples with a unique greeting. And He had never said it this way before. And also, these were the very first words out of His mouth, when he appeared to them after the resurrection. And again, of course, that is the message titled, Peace Be With You. So turn again to John chapter 20, verse 19. This was our introduction on Sunday. And it's just a peculiar thing. Um, at least what, that's how the Spirit hit me with it um, weeks ago as I was preparing that, again, not only did he never use this exact phrase before, but he also it was the first words out of his mouth after the resurrection. John twenty nineteen. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. We also noted briefly on Sunday that this declaration of peace is connected with fulfilling the Great Commission in verse 21. You know, even, even Pastor and Joey going to India, it's, it's going there to proclaim the Lord's peace, really, to other believers and especially also to the world that don't know about His peace. 
But, and verse 21 again, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So in a way, the Lord is saying, share my peace with others. Really, that's what we do when we entertain the gospel. When we carry the gospel and share it, we're sharing his peace with others. So we'll see how this all ties in as we continue this series this week. I'll look at verse 26, John 20, 26. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Again on the board, regarding peace be with you, that we live in his peace is clearly one of our Lord's great desires for us. And now that it's finished, in John 19.30, we can truly rest, rest in and live in the peace that he purchased for us. What's the difference between the Lord's wishes in John 14, where he said to them, I'm going to leave you my peace. And then in John 20, this new declaration, peace be with you. The difference is that it is finished. It was finished on the cross. Everything changed. Everything that was planned, everything that was talked about for thousands of years, by God, through the prophets, to the Jews, all that finally was fulfilled. And now the perspective changes. The way you look at the cross changes, literally even by timeline. Because now everything is finished. The spiritual reality had, um, had changed. All right, where, for example, in the Old Testament, the, the, the blood of the animal sacrifices temporarily covered the sins, right? But it was a temporary covering until the Lamb of God would come and take away the sins of the whole world. So you go from that perspective of our sins are covered for now, and by faith we know God's going to come and take care of it once for all one day, and now we look back on it. And having the ability and the privilege, I guess, of saying, wow, now it's completely done. And so the Lord, you know, even changed his greeting. On the board, uh, peace made possible now. After the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, sin and death were officially and completely defeated, taken out of the way of man's relationship with God. Before the cross, people could, you know, might have worried about this, right? Gee, is God really going to do what he says he's going to do? He's going to suffer for our sakes, etc., right? And what if something happens? What if he doesn't follow through? And that's our human thinking, of course. But now it's different. It's already taken out of the way. Go to Colossians 2, verse 13. Anything that was a hindrance between man and God has now been taken out of the way, completely removed. Colossians 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's a great statement, isn't it? I always picture all of our sins listed, you know, like every single one of them on some document, and he literally nailed them to the cross, you know. But he's taken it out of the way, to our point on the board. So with the debt removed, peace with God was now truly possible, for those who would repent and trust in Christ. Thus the declaration after the resurrection, peace be with you. The offer of peace that God made to man was now consummated, even by a death, which was necessary to enter into the covenant of God. And now his inheritance of spiritual blessings could be distributed freely to the heirs, which are those who are followers of Jesus Christ. The Spirit brought this up on Sunday. A man's last will and testament lies dormant and powerless until the man's death. And then, finally, upon a man's death, and even his death being proven, then that document comes to life. 
and it has power. The words are enacted into life. So his wishes for his assets are now actively and properly granted to his heirs who were left behind. We saw on Sunday in Hebrews 9, 16 through 17 on the board in the NIV. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. You know, I was just reading that earlier today and I was thinking, you know how someone goes missing, like on a boat or something, right? People are missing in the news, right? Where's this person? Until they prove the death of the individual, that their assets aren't being released. That will's not going to go into effect. You know what I mean? Their estate is staying intact, etc. So it's interesting that it says, in the case of a will, it's necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. So a little more context. Turn to Hebrews 9, verse 15. Hebrews 9, 15. You know, a lot of people say, why did Jesus have to die on the cross for our sins? Well, this might be a good point to share with them. You know, that the inheritance can't be passed on until the death of that, the possessor of all the blessings. Uh, Hebrews 9.15, For this reason, he, the Lord, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of, e of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. Again, the first covenant, Old Testament, right? animal sacrifices in place to cover the sins temporarily. Even that first covenant didn't go into effect without the uh, shedding of blood. It was necessary to pass on the promise of forgiveness. So again, when someone dies, the assets in one's last will and testament are now legally distributed. One of the major accomplishments from our Lord's death and resurrection was that we could now inherit true peace with God, complete peace with God. In other words, it wasn't just talked about anymore, like the Jews were talking about it for thousands of years, wait, waiting for the Messiah. It wasn't just a discussion, it was fulfilled. And look at how the author of Hebrews ended this letter to the Jews. Again, go to Hebrews 13, verse 20. We're still doing... A fair amount of review here from Sunday. And we're, I want you to know like we're establishing kind of a foundation for the end of week lessons. Um, it's very important to establish this foundation and the understanding of even reconciliation because at the end we're going to see how to use God's peace. But obviously you have to understand it to use it. Uh, Hebrews 13.20 now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So it was through the blood of the eternal covenant in verse 20. And through Jesus Christ. So the Lord's peace is one of these things that he equips us with. It's, again, kind of funny that, um, you know, we've been on the series on the apostles being equipped, right, by grace. Obviously, the Spirit is working all these things, weaving all these things together. Um, he says in verse 21, you know, may the God of peace equip you in every good thing to do his will. And part of that equipping is with his peace. It's now conferred to us as part of our inheritance from the Lord's death. On the board, we also saw Sunday from the pulpit commentary on peace be with you. 
Jesus was now coming to his disciples in an utterly different, in utterly different circumstances from any in which he had come before. Right? After the resurrection, peace be with you. Jesus was now coming to his disciples in utterly different circumstances from any in which he had come before. So now, even Jesus was able to look back at his victory on the cross. You know, some of you are wondering, how am I going to get through what I'm going through right now in life, right? Can you imagine the relief the Lord had when he's finally able to say, I, I'm done, I did it, and now I'm resurrected, to look back on that with whew, satisfaction or, wow. But anyway, even Jesus now was looking back on the cross three days later. And so that's how it is for anyone going forward from the cross on the timeline of history. For example, the letters to the churches in the New Testament are written in a style of looking back at the cross and the Lord's accomplishments on the cross. So the perspective has now changed as well as the spiritual reality. And we can see how the apostles, like Paul, now viewed salvation, it already being accomplished in Christ. That's what we see when we read the New Testament letters. So uh, turn again to Ephesians 2, verse 11. And maybe you'll see that a little bit more now than you did on Sunday. Everything changed after the resurrection. Every spiritual reality even changed. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now, you see the timeline? Paul, you know, is looking back. At that time, you were separate from Christ. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it, the cross, having put to death the enmity. See, again, Paul's looking back on it. It's done. There's no more questions. There's no more waiting. And in verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we now have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So there we see Paul looking back at the victory of the cross and speaking in the past tense. And we now have access to God, free access to God. That wasn't available before in verse 18. So peace with God has now been attained by Christ for mankind once for all. So let's transition a little bit now. The only thing that stands in the way of us and God's peace is us. The Lord has done everything necessary to give us peace with God. And what do we do? We doubt it and question it. It's what we do. In these bodies, it'll go on till the day we die to some degree. And the way we live our lives reveals our doubts and questions, if you think about it. Sometimes we wonder, why am I staying in this lifestyle? Why am I refusing to fully trust God in this area of my life? Well, there's doubts and questions in the back of your mind that you're, you're not receiving His promises. You're not, you're not receiving His peace. 
We talked about on Sunday receiving his peace on the board and how we often keep our eyes of faith closed or just squinting through to take a peek, not fully trusting. But the Lord wants us to embrace his peace with eyes wide open. Look at what he's done for us and receive his peace by faith. The Lord didn't surrender himself to judgment and death on a cross for nothing. In fact, it was to fully accomplish everything for an unfettered relationship with our God and Creator. There's nothing in the way anymore. Zero. We're the only ones that get in the way. So on the board, Jesus' death grants us peace. It was for eternal peace with God, so that as believers we could become, uh, He could become our Father, even though as sinners we were His enemies. And our Lord also promised to never leave us or forsake us, remember, in the Scriptures. He didn't just leave His disciples high and dry after His victory. In fact, He gave us His very own Spirit to be with us every day to be at our side, He Himself being our peace. Isn't that what we saw in Ephesians 2, was it? Yeah, Ephesians 2, 14. He Himself is our peace. So go in your Bibles to John 14, verse 16. And let's be reminded how our Lord is always with us. And that alone... Uh, if we have faith, should give us great peace. John 14, 16. Jesus said, I will ask, ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jump to verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. So this passage really was a prophetic statement by the Lord speaking to them here before the cross in John 14, telling them how he would be with them after the cross. And remember, he and the Holy Spirit are the same and the Father are the same. They're one and the same God. They're one and the same Spirit. So we're literally talking about the Spirit of Christ himself being with us forever. So this is another reason we can have his peace. On the board, we also saw on Sunday, Jesus' death grants us peace. Our Lord and Savior and substitute walks with us every day as our resurrected King. Turn uh, again to Psalm 16, verse 8. Again, our Lord and Savior and Substitute walks with us every day as our resurrected King. Even in the form of the Holy Spirit. His Spirit. We know He holds up those who believe by His right hand, according to Scripture. And before we read this, uh, we're, we're seeing the confidence of David that David had in this fact that the Lord was by his right hand always. And this was before the Lord's sacrifice at the cross. And again, just a reminder, as we read this, even before Christ came, David saw the Lord as risen from the grave by faith. So look at Psalm 16, verse 8. David said, I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. 
For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. And by the way, that includes you, his child. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. So that's the intimate status of a life with God, with Christ. And Psalm 1835, go to Psalm 1835. David said, You have also given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand upholds me, and your gentleness makes me great. Again, David said this before everything was accomplished at the cross. On the board, if David had this peace from God's presence by faith, how much more should we now have it that our debt has been fully paid and Jesus is resurrected from the dead in victory? There's no more worrying. There's no more anticipation. There's no more waiting. The victory is complete. And this is one of the reasons Jesus said to the disciples, peace be with you. It's finished. The only question with us is, will we receive his peace or not? So on the board, regarding a life of peace, he desires so greatly that we possess and enjoy his peace, the peace that surpasses all comprehension, the peace he died to freely give us. Philippians 4, verse 7. What was emphasized on Sunday was this on the board regarding this life of peace. It's a daily opportunity. The Lord wants us to know we can't do this without Him ever. So He's designed life so that a daily reliance on Him is needed to experience His peace. Remember, this is all about sanctification. Why are we left here after we're born again and saved. It must be a big deal. It must be an important reason or He would have just took us to heaven already. So this is all part of our sanctification, proving to Satan and the fallen angels that little peons like us, sinners like us that are much lesser than the angels, can live and walk by faith and bring glory to God, can have the peace of God every day by humbly submitting, which is what Satan wouldn't do, right? Just by daily doing that, we, the, the amount of glory, like, so we, we can't comprehend the amount of glory this brings God in the invisible war. And so this is part of our sanctification, this thing on the board. Some of you are like, yeah, but I'm tired. <laughs> Why do I have to do this every day? Why can't I just trust in God and He gives me His peace permanently and, you know, I'm good? Because there's a point to be proven. And you and I have the chance to be witnesses, right? Even in a courtroom, a heavenly courtroom. Again, it's all about a life of peace that um, kind of shows up Satan and the fallen angels. It's a daily opportunity. The Lord wants us to know we can't do this without Him ever. So He has designed life so that a daily reliance of Him is needed to experience His peace. Part of our sanctification. And his peace can only be received through living by faith. Thank God it's a simple plan and a simple system. But we have to just get out of the way, right? Go again to Philippians 4, verse 4. And let's see how we can live in this peace that Christ purchased for us. How do we experience it daily? Philippians 4, verse 4. Some of you probably can recite this by memory now. This has been coming up a lot in all of our studies the last six months, maybe. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Notice that. That stuck out to me today as I was reviewing. The Lord is near. Remember David said, he's at my right hand. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice again, for God's peace to guard your hearts and minds, no matter what you're going through, you must live a life of faith, as seen in verses 4 through 6, for example. That's the way, that's the setup, that's the design that God put in place. We must live a life of faith. We must do the things listed in verses 4 through 6 as a uh, living out the spiritual life by faith, and then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then again, it doesn't stop there as Paul continues to describe what it means to live by faith in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Notice for a minute, this verse is not telling us to be perfect. It's not telling us to always be true, honorable, right, pure, or lovely, right? What is it telling us to do? Dwell on these things. Place your mind and your heart on these things instead of the ugliness in the world, the temptations in the world. Place your mind and your heart on these things. Like we just got done with marriage, right? And then the American dating counterfeit, right? Place your mind on the goodness of God, the, the, the purity of God, and these things. And then dwell on these things. And in verse 9, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So dwell on these things and practice these things, and then the God of peace will be with you. It's a crystal clear picture of how to receive and enjoy the Lord's peace. It's a daily choice whether we will dwell on these things and practice these things or not, which is directly related to the God of peace being with you. On Sunday, we saw a quote from a daily devotional book called Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. And uh, I want to revisit this, just read through it one more time, so sit back and just take it in. There's a lot of valuable um, perspective there. And again, let me remind you, she writes from the perspective of the Lord. So this was from April 18th from the book uh, Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. Peace is my continual gift to you. It flows abundantly from my throne of grace. Just as the Israelites could not store up manna for the future, but had to gather it daily, so it is with my peace. The day-by-day -day collecting of manna kept my people aware of their dependence on me. Similarly, I give you sufficient peace for the present when you come to me by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. If I gave you permanent peace, independent of my presence, you might fall into the trap of self-sufficiency. May that never be. I have designed you to need me moment by moment. As your awareness of your neediness increases, so does your realization of my abundant sufficiency. And then she closes like this. I can meet every one of your needs without draining my resources at all. Approach my throne of grace with bold confidence, receiving my peace with a thankful heart. Exodus 16, 15 through 16, Philippians 4, 6 through 7 and 19, and Hebrews 4, 16. So we saw the analogy on Sunday that she points out here about the Jews being in the desert and being given food directly from God but only enough food for each day, one at a time. It's interesting, isn't it? Why didn't God, who wants to bless his children, give them barns full of stored food and crops and blessings and just uh, let them party, I don't know, tons of wine, right? Let them just have a good time as his children. Why did he do this day-by-day -day thing? 
Turn again to Exodus 16, verse 14. There must be a reason, right? You mean there might be a divine purpose in this thing called life? Like bigger picture? You mean there might be eternal repercussions to whether we live by faith day by day or not? Yeah. There's a, there's a big deal going on behind the scenes. Exodus 16, verse 14. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece, according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so. Some gathered much and some little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess. He who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But, of course... (laughs) Just like all of us, they didn't listen to Moses. And some left part of it until morning. Wouldn't we, don't, you, don't we do the same thing? I'm going to save some just in case God doesn't provide for me tomorrow. Boy, just a plain lack of faith. So they did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. So here, the Spirit gave us a very important point on Sunday, on the board, regarding our daily bread. We can't live off of yesterday's spiritual food, yesterday's Bible reading, or yesterday's Bible lesson. Our soul needs fresh spiritual food and nutrition every day, just as God designed our bodies to need food daily. Pretty simple. But it's a reality. God designed it that way for a reason. Verse 21. They gathered it, the bread, morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. And there again is the faithfulness of God, right? God even made sure they couldn't grab too much. They couldn't even come back and grab a little later if they were still hungry, for example, even though God gave them the perfect amount. They couldn't grab too much, looking to prepare for tomorrow. It was a a one-day-at-a-time life with God. So maybe this is why the Lord said what He said to us in Matthew chapter 6. Turn to Matthew 6, verse 25. And when you accept that God has designed life this way, And when you believe that he loves you so much that he does the best for you, then this becomes much easier. You know, instead of struggling and asking God why or whatever and asking for the easy way out instead of a daily walk of faith, you know, you might actually come to some peace about the whole thing. And as we read this passage, what's the opposite of peace? Worry and anxiety. And while we read this, here's what I want you to do while we read this passage. Think of the King of glory, your resurrected King, Jesus Christ, being with you at your right hand. And I want you to right now picture walking with him in a field, him right by your side, pointing all these things out to you as evidence for God's care. Matthew 6, 25. For this reason I say to you, Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at that word life. Is not life living, isn't it more than food? Isn't it, you know, more than clothing? There's this thing called life. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
How does he feed the birds, by the way? One day at a time. Are, they, are you not worth much more than they? And you, or, or who of you, being worried, can add a single hour to the, his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And to our point on only, only gathering enough for, for today, verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So we have a pretty good analogy here in the daily collection of the manna in the wilderness. On the board, we might call it piece by piece. There's a little pun for you that the Spirit gave us. We need to go to the Lord one day at a time in humility if we want to enjoy his peace. The Lord, out of his great love for us, will not allow us to experience his peace unless we follow him. And that is grace. That is love. Because he's got the big picture in mind. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's accomplishing in us. And in heaven, we're all going to thank him up and down for the daily walk that he commanded of us. Again, we need to go to the Lord one day at a time, piece by piece, if you will, in humility, if we want to enjoy His peace. The Lord, out of His great love for us, will not allow us to experience His peace unless we follow Him. For example, John 10, 27 through 30, which came up on Sunday, and Philippians 4, 6 through 7, which we've already seen. We saw on Sunday how in John 10, even the peace of eternal security is related to following the Lord one day at a time. Following Him. That's what gives you that peace and that awareness. But to find grace and peace each day, as it says in John 10. <laughs> one second. It's having a good time. It's the first warm day, right? But... To find His grace and peace each day, we must hear His voice and follow Him each day. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And we must approach His throne of grace each day. On the board, Hebrews 4.16 in the Amplified Version, Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need. Appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. But go to the throne of grace boldly. Isn't that kind of what Jesus was saying in Matthew 6? I provide for the birds and the plants and everything. Why are you worrying? You don't think I'm going to provide for you? Just ask and it will be given. Seek first the kingdom and all these things are going to be added to you. So on Sunday, we also saw what made this actual peace with God possible. We saw the relationship between righteousness and peace. The believer now has peace with God. Why? He's right with God. He's righteous by the blood of Christ. It's already been accomplished. It's done. It's finished. Peace be with you. Because of Christ's victory at the cross and in resurrection, righteousness and peace have now kissed each other. Turn again to Psalm 85, verse 10. Actually, we'll start in verse 8. 
Psalm 85, verse 8. Again, on the board, the believer now has peace with God. He's right with God. He's righteous because of the blood of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Because of Christ's victory at the cross and in resurrection, righteousness and peace have now kissed each other. I mean, think about it. For years, the Jews were looking forward to this day when righteousness and peace would kiss each other. As written in Psalm 85, verse 8. I will hear what the Lord uh, what God the Lord will say. For he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met each other, or have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Do you remember in the New Testament... Jesus was the manifestation of grace and truth. Loving kindness is the Old Testament word for grace. Again, verse 10. Loving kindness or grace and truth have met met together. See, this is a prophecy about the Messiah fulfilling whatever was needed to save us. Loving kindness or grace and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So now that we've been made righteous through Christ, we have peace with our almighty God. On the board, righteousness and peace. If you have trusted in Christ to save you from sin and death, then you are now righteous in God's eyes. He has made you holy by grace, and you can confidently walk by faith in the peace of Christ. In other words, we have no reason anymore to not be at peace. There's no more anticipation and waiting. We have no reason to not walk by faith in the peace of Christ. We just get in the way. But if you're a believer, peace be with you. That's the Lord's great wish for us now. He's like, it's done. Don't waste it. Peace be with you. Go, walk, be at peace, whatever you do. You're in Christ. So turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. As we begin to close. And let's see here again, Paul looking back on the peace already established by Christ at the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. See, it's on the past tense now. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I hope again you see the connection between peace and righteousness, even in this passage. On the board, reconciliation means we now have peace with God through His Son. We have this peace because God, by grace, has made us righteous by His blood. The death has taken place. The inheritance from the will can now be freely distributed, fully distributed. The power has been released, the power of that document, the power of that covenant that God made with man. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other once for all because of Christ. So we might say on the board, peace be with you. We now have a position of peace with God. And this position of peace has purchased for us the opportunity to live by and enjoy His peace every day. Think about it this way, as came up on Sunday, 
When a peace treaty is signed between warring nations, the people celebrate joyously, don't they? Sometimes they might even party in the streets. This is because they can now go forward and live in peace without worrying about violence and antagonism. We don't have to worry anymore about God's wrath. We're at peace with him now by his grace and by his blood. He literally did everything for the peace to be established. So we as believers can now go forward and live in peace. We should be celebrating every day because the contract, the peace treaty has been signed. How much more so once we have peace with our perfect God who does not change his mind? Just rest on that, you know. How much more so should we have peace now that this contract is signed, this peace treaty is signed by the blood of Christ? How much more should we have peace with our perfect God knowing that he can't even change his mind? What an awesome God we have. Thank God for that. So after the resurrection and ascension of Christ, even the disciples started to greet each other this way. As you look at the church letters, the church age letters, a lot of them by Paul, you see this phrase, grace and peace be to you. You know, in other words, on the merits of Christ, peace to you. It's done. It's finished. He wants you to live in peace, his peace. So we saw on Sunday regarding this phrase, peace be with you. The Lord is saying something like this. Live in my peace. I've saved you by grace. Your price has now been paid. Now trust me and live in the peace that I've granted you for all eternity with me. Live by faith. And here's what we're going to get to later this week. The Spirit is also desiring to change our perspective about His peace. On the board, regarding perspective on His peace, look at His peace, the very peace of Christ, as a weapon in your life. And there's a reason that this is being said, which we'll delve into more. Look at His peace, the very peace of Christ, as a weapon in your life. It is the very means and power by which you're enabled to live life and to spread the gospel. It's the very means and power by which you can live in the gospel reality. Live being the key word. So on the board, regarding perspective on his peace, his peace is a spiritual weapon of great import. He designed it that way so that his plan cannot be fulfilled by our own will or power, but only by standing in his peace. Ephesians 6, to give you a hint. So again, the Spirit wants to change our perspective on his peace a little bit. Maybe we're not looking at it uh, rightly or in the way it fully is designed to be taken in. On the board, his peace is a spiritual weapon of great import. He designed it that way, so that his plan cannot be fulfilled by our own will or power, but by standing in his peace. Ephesians chapter 6. And that way, to God be all the glory. Right? To God be all the glory. If there wasn't this daily requirement of living by faith to gain his peace, it would be to us be the glory in some way. We'd be able to take some credit you know, we'd be boasting. So this is the way that God is divinely ordained to stand in his peace and use it as a spiritual weapon even. So we'll continue with more of this on Thursday. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for your wonderful word, for the truth that sets us free. Help us, Father, to have more faith, increase our faith. Help us to see you at our right hand at all times, to see you walking us through the field of life, pointing out all the provisions you've made, even for things that are much less important, knowing that you have us in your right hand and that you promise to provide one day at a time. Father, we ask that you help us bring these truths out to a lost and dying world that needs it so desperately. 
We ask these things in Christ's precious name and by the power of your spirit, we pray.